All right, well, we're going to launch into it tonight. Are you ready? We're going to have a good time together. So we're going to read from the gospel written by a guy named Matthew. My name's Matthew, so I thought I'd find a scripture in there to read tonight. And we're going to read from chapter 16, verse, I think, 18. And it will be up on the screen. So I can just shuffle this way a little bit. Maybe not shuffle, I'll just walk. And um, let's read it. This is Jesus speaking to Peter and his disciples. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven heaven. Let's pray quickly. Father, I thank you for what you want to impress upon our hearts tonight. God, I thank you that it would be a truth, a reality that causes us to expand in our thinking and advance in our moving. Father, we just invite you in to this message right now, and we give you the glory, and we give you the praise. Amen. 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 Well, I was here a few weeks ago, actually, and I spoke a message called The Second Wave 2.0. Anyone here a few weeks ago heard that message? And um, I thought I would do the part two tonight, but part I already called my first one 2.0, so tonight's message I've titled The Second Wave 2.0. 20.20, and I will explain why that number system in a moment. But my first message, I talked about the number two, and where we find the number two or occurrences within our Bible of things taking place twice, and what God is drawing our attention to. And the number two, often in the Scriptures, is pointing towards an advancing work of God, a continual work to completion of something that God has started. So God advancing His work to a completion from what was once started. And tonight we're going to talk around the number 20. And in the Bible, when we find the number 20, it often coincides with this that God is drawing our attention to when God brings something to completion after a period of wait. After a period of wait. And I find that there is this pattern that we find all so often in the Scriptures, that there is a promise given, but then there's a time that perseverance is required before we can take possession. So there's a promise, there's perseverance, and then there's possession. I know that for most of us, we like the idea of promise, possession. (laughs) But often, there is a period of perseverance. There is a period of wait. And within that period, there's often challenge, trial, struggle. But we always have to remember that God is in that gap. God is always in the wait, and in actual fact, it's in that period of wait, it's in that period of perseverance where we are shaped the most. So let's have a look at this tonight, and the first occurrence of the number 20 we're going to come around starts with the story of Jacob. See, God gives Jacob a promise that from his life will emerge a great people. He gave this promise to Abraham and then to Isaac, and Isaac gives it or passes it on to Jacob. And Isaac gives Jacob the instruction, you need to go, you need to leave this place, and you need to go to a land where Laban is, a man named Laban, and you are to find yourself a wife Because you need a wife to start a family so that you can see this promise fulfilled in your life. You can see God establish 
in your lifetime, in your generation, what was promised to Abraham, and then to me, Isaac, and now to you, Jacob. So Jacob leaves, and there's this very famous story in the Bible where he sleeps and he has this vision at a place called Bethel. And basically, God himself reinforces this promise. This promise was given to him or relayed to him by Isaac, his father, but then God comes along and personally confirms or affirms this promise that from Jacob's life, a great household will arise, a mighty nation, and God puts this promise or cements this promise in his heart. So he goes to Laban to find himself a wife, but it's interesting that he ends up working for Laban for 20 years. And there was a 20-year period that Jacob found himself toiling, struggling, before he really started to see this promise take shape in his life. And I reckon most of us can relate to this story, where there's something on the inside of us that God has put there, maybe personally for us, or something that we know to be true in the Bible, a promise from God, and we know that it will happen. We know there's a day coming that we will see it take shape in our life, but we find ourselves in this period of wait. We find ourselves in this period of toil, this period of struggle, and sometimes in that place, the promise can seem to get further away than closer, right? Sometimes in that place, what can happen is we can almost lose heart, we can lose perspective, we can lose focus, and I feel that Jacob in this time, that started happening to him, and there's this passage that we find this conversation that Jacob has with Laban. I've just got to unlock my iPad here tonight. And it's found in Genesis chapter 31. I'm not sure if I gave the team this passage of Scripture to put up on the screen. And Jacob is having this conversation with Laban, and he says this, There I was, day by day, the heat consumed me and the cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed." But God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. So we can see Jacob struggling with this. And he has this conversation with Laban. 20 years it took for this promise to start to take shape in Jacob's life. And my heart, And what I'm feeling, I guess, in my spirit for you as individuals, but also for us as a church, and we are one church in three locations. My wife and I, we're out at Springfield, and then we've got our location at Inner East right in the city there, and I'm really believing that we are on the cusp of something incredible. But just before the cusp, or maybe like the gap between the promise and the cusp of something happening. There is a struggle, there's work to be done, there's labor, there's, there's pressing in. But I'm believing that we're gonna see something incredible. But maybe for your life tonight, maybe you're in a place and you feel, yes, I'm believing that I'm on that same cusp in my world. I'm believing that God's gonna do something significant. God's gonna bring something into my world that I have been waiting for. I'm believing that God is going to bring that to fruition in your world, but we have to trust in him. Jacob has a son, and his name is Joseph. When Joseph was 17 years old, he has a dream. God puts a promise in Joseph's heart, just like he put a promise in Jacob's heart. But when he was 17 and he received this dream, two dreams in actual fact, and this promise was given to him, and many of us would know the story, 
He told this promise, he told these dreams to his brothers and his brothers were filled with jealousy. They were jealous of the favour that was upon his life. They were jealous of the call that was upon his life. And so at the age of 17, he was thrown into a pit and he was sold by his brothers into slavery. It's interesting that 20 years later, after, Jacob, after Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 shekels of silver, 20 years later, there was a great famine that came into the land in which they dwelt. 20 years later, but what was fascinating is what took place because of this famine. And I want to really, I think, look at some parallels to this story and what Joseph experienced and what took place in Jacob's household. Because it was this, fam this famine that caused Joseph to be re reunited with his family. It was actually this, this extreme trial that they were faced with that caused God's community to come back together. See, there was a famine that came into the land that lasted for seven years. And during the seven years, the people of Egypt ended up selling their goods. They sold their livestock. They sold their land. And they got so desperate to survive, they ended up selling themselves as slaves to the state, to Egypt. They, become, they became under the ownership of Egypt. And the only people... The only people who emerged out of this extreme trial, the only ones who emerged with property, with land, was God's people. Because Jacob and his household came into the land of Egypt, and Pharaoh gave them not just land, but the best land in the region. Everyone else found themselves in slavery. And I'm believing this is a picture for us. And I'm believing this is a picture for the church. We find ourselves in this year, 2020, a year that none of us expected it to look like this. But here we find ourselves, and even though from the outset, even though in the natural, it seems like what good could come of this year, I'm believing something better than we have ever experienced before is going to come from this season. Just like in that time with Joseph Jacob, that God's people emerged victorious. God's people emerged with land, with possession, with livestock. I'm believing that's true for your life. I'm believing that's true for our church. But not only did God's people emerge with land, with property, but there was reconciliation between Joseph, Jacob, and his family. And now we start to see, now it's two lots of 20 years, 20.20. 20. From when Jacob received the dream, the promise, and then he toiled and labored under Laban, and then he moved out from there and he started to build his own household, and then his son, whom was destined to carry on the family promise, was sold into slavery. 20 years again later, this famine comes that brings the families back together. See, God promised Jacob that he would establish his community through his family. And in the Bible, God talks about establishing 12 tribes of Israel. The problem is, Jacob only had 11 sons. So how is 12 tribes of Israel going to emerge from 11 sons? And this is the beautiful part of this picture. Because when Jacob gets reunited with Joseph, Jacob says, Joseph, bring me your two sons. Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Instead of Joseph, they became the 11th and 12th tribe of Israel. And we start to see this promise come to pass. We start to see this mighty community, this mighty household start to take shape. But it took time, 
and it took a great struggle, and it took perseverance, and it took trust, and it took faith. But one thing I'm convinced of, that it happened like that because of what took place in the struggle. And I believe Joseph is this great picture for our lives of how he responded to the struggle. Even though he was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, put into prison on more than one occasion, he remained faithful. He trusted in God. He had a godly attitude. He did what was right, not what was easy. He didn't take shortcuts. He did it God's way. And I'm believing that's a picture for us. We need to keep faith in our God. We need to trust in Him. And God will bring us in to this new, beautiful reality. God is building His community. And if we go back to that scripture in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I think sometimes it's a little bit difficult when we read this because there's a couple of words I think that it's hard for us to fully get the full picture. And one of those words is church. When we read the word church, we have a certain image, I think, that comes into our mind of what that is and maybe what Jesus was talking about. But I love the word that Jesus used here that we have translated to the word church. He uses the word ecclesia, which is a Greek word. And he basically stole this word from the secular society and applied it to what God wanted to do here on planet Earth. Because in this Greco-Roman society, the ecclesia, or the ecclesia, however you wish to pronounce it, the ecclesia was this central gathering place in the heart of culture, in the heart of society. It was by no means a place that was hidden away out the back. It was the mo- in the most central central aspect of the bustling cultural society at that time. And Jesus uses this word and he said, this is what I want the church to look like. And we see this picture of maybe what the ecclesia would look like. And in the ecclesia is where all the important people came. The the word ecclesia basically means to come out from your private dwellings into the marketplace, into society. And it's in this place where they debated ideas. It's in this place where they, they um, strategized military operations, where they discussed politics. All these things took place in the ecclesia. The big decisions of the day were, were made in this place. And Jesus is saying, you know how society revolves around this gathering? This is what I want the church to be. I want the church I want my people, I want my kingdom to gather in the central most part of society and culture. I don't want my church to be hidden away in a corner. I want my people to be front and center. And that's why Jesus says the ecclesia of God's kingdom is to be like a city on a hill, never meant to be hidden. But something else that's interesting in this passage that Jesus speaks where he says, I will build my ecclesia on this rock. The question is, what is this rock that he's talking about? Obviously, Peter's name means rock. God is referred to as the rock. Jesus is referred to as a rock, a cornerstone in the Bible. But what, in fact, is Jesus talking about? I want my people to gather on this rock? Well, the place that they were standing at this very time when Jesus spoke these words is a place called Caesarea Philippi. And there's a picture here we can put up on the screen. And they were literally standing on this rock. They were standing on a cliff made of solid rock. And below them was a temple dedicated to the Greek god Pan. And in this temple was a grotto, and there's another picture of this grotto here, um, where they would make sacrifices to this God. And the community called this grotto the Gate of Hades. And so Jesus speaks these words, and he says, hey guys, 
this rock where we stand, where they're literally right now worshipping false gods, making sacrifices, this place I want my people to gather extraordinary words that Jesus speaks. And there's a, there's a picture of what they think this would have looked like here at um, Philippi here. This is what they think it might have looked like with temples. But basically, when Jesus said this, this was one of the major meeting places of culture. This is where it all happened. And Jesus said, see all these people who are living in idolatry. See all these people who are worshipping false gods, that's where I want my church to be. That's where I want my people to be. The word ecclesia in the book of Revelations appears 20 times. God made a promise. I will build my church upon this rock. A gathering, a community, a household that would not be hidden away, but it would be front and center. A community that would influence this world. A community that would cause radical change in our society. A light that will shine so bright that people from all walks of life will be attracted to it. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. In the Old Testament, there was a time of judges, and there was people commissioned by God to become judges of Israel, basically to protect God's community. The final judge was a guy named Samson, and he judged for 20 years. And he was the final judge judge of Israel. And there's this scene towards the end or at the very end of Samson's life where he's captured and he's in shackles and he's put into a prison in this gathering place. And basically all of the main players who are in opposition to God's people are in this place. The enemy of Israel is in this building and he finds himself beneath them in this prison. And Samson cries out to God with one last request. God, would you give me strength right now so I can bring down these pillars and take down this whole system? And Samson reaches out and he grabs these pillars and with one last breath, he pulls them down and the whole thing collapses. He takes down the opposition, the enemy that is against God's people. And the great beauty of our Christian faith is Jesus did that same thing on the cross. Jesus hung on the cross and just like Samson, he grabbed those pillars. And in his final breath, he took down the power of sin and death. And he brought a great liberation He brought a great freedom to God's people. He launched us into the great promise of I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, against it. What does that mean for our lives? It means we need to step into this promise. It means we need to rise into the strength of God because he has got much to do through our lives. And the things that you are believing for, the promises that you feel God has placed in your life for your family, let's put our confidence in Christ who brought down the powers of sin and darkness. We're no longer shackled, we've been set free. But there is periods of trial, there is periods of perseverance, but in that place, Jesus refines us, Jesus shapes us and molds us into what God wants us to be. We are the church, the ecclesia, God's gathered people here on this planet. 
and it's the year 2020. And I'm believing that there has been a period of wait, but God is bringing to completion something that He is doing. And we're about to step into a new season, a new day. The question is, are we ready for it?